can play around, but it should just be us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, a very warm welcome to uh, to all of you today. On behalf of uh, both Brantwood, uh, Ruskin's former home in Lund in uh, in the Lake District, and uh, Ruskin today, um, the organisation that helps. Uh, coordinate all the interests that there are, many interests that there are in Ruskin, uh, both in this country and indeed around the world. Um, and this annual lecture, sponsored by Sovereign Films, is a real highlight of our uh, coming together and uh, celebrating Ruskin's extraordinary diversity in terms of his influence in the arts, in science, in uh, social thinking and so forth. Anyway, I'm uh, Delighted this evening to see so many of you uh, to welcome you and to ask Phil Sherman, the director of the Warburg Institute, uh, if you'd like to say a few words. Thank you so much. Well, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this new auditorium at the Warburg Institute. It is literally and figuratively the centerpiece of our recent renovation launched exactly one month ago today. So it is new. Um, our hope in designing the project was that it would allow us to host events with new partners, just like this one. So delighted to have you all here. But in this case, the featured speaker actually represents uh, not a new, but an old partner, the National Gallery, with whom we at the Warburg have been offering an MA in curation for over a decade. The program, like so much else at the National Gallery, is in the hands of our speaker, Christine Riding. Director of Collections and Research, and formerly Jacob Rothschild, Head of the Curatorial Department and Curator of British Paintings. <clears throat> These roles at the NG followed positions, as you will no doubt know, at the Museum of London, Palace of Westminster, Tate, and Royal Museums Greenwich. Few people, I think, have done more to breathe new life into these venerable institutions as a curator of exhibitions, such as Hogarth and Gauguin at the Tate, or Gainsborough Turner and now Constable at the NG, as a champion of new acquisitions, including the Armada portrait of Elizabeth I, as a passionate advocate for working with contemporary artists, commissioning Richard Wright's installation in the Great Hall at the Queen's House in Greenwich, and as a leader of Capital Project, something near and dear to my heart, culminating, uh, as you'll all be aware, in NG 200, marking the bicentenary of the National Gallery, including the first complete redisplay of the collection in over 30 years, and something especially near to my heart, the redevelopment of the NG's research center as part of the NG 200 Welcome Program. Uh, but for now, I hope you'll join me in welcoming Christine here at the Warburg to the podium for the 10th annual Ruskin Today Brantwood Lecture. Over to you, Christine. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, and actually, I should take off my. So I've got my NG two hundred, NG two hundred pass, and I take that off. Um, and thank you for that lovely introduction. And also, I want to thank Robert Hewson for inviting me to give this talk today. Robert and I have known each other twenty five years. When we were in our mid twenties, we met. Um, and uh, and it's a, it's a really wonderful opportunity with all the things that uh, Bill mentioned just now in terms of what I'm doing as my day job to actually be invited to think about something that um, a subject that I've been involved in in some way, shape or form since I you know, supported Robert and his wonderful exhibition Ruskin Turn the Pre-Raphaelites in 2000 at the Tate Gallery. I think that was the last exhibition at the Tate Gallery and I worked on the, ne the first Tate Britain one, which was William Blake. So it was a real wonderful crossover moment and something that actually it's an experience that I really cherished. And I'm hoping what I'm going to be doing today is in not only as a kind of summary of a lot of um, projects and uh, research that I've done since that point, which has informed this talk, but also I hope to give a, a, a context um, to the writings of John Ruskin, you know, someone who is so wide ranging. But what I'm going to be really looking at today is his perceptions of um, marine painting, of um, really about the nation itself and its relationship to see, uh, painting the sea, 
but at a, but through the lens, of course, at that tremendously important battle, not just in terms of the Napoleonic War period, but also I think in terms of perceptions of of Nelson Navy Nation, and that is of course the Battle of Trafalgar, which was well, in fact we just missed the the uh, anniversary, which is fought on the 21st of October 1805. Now, if I was giving this lecture at Greenwich, I wouldn't have to say anything more about the Battle of Trafalgar. Um, but what I will say here, and I'm sure you've got a sense of it and its importance to the psychology of the nation and the Navy, let alone an artist, let alone um, its strategic importance, was that it was a strategic victory um, for the com um, against the combined French and Spanish fleets of the British Navy or Royal Navy with I Vice Admiral Nelson in command of the fleet. Now, Nelson talked about what the outcome was, what the expectations were, um, both from the Admiralty, but also the public. And that was that they didn't want something that was decisive, merely decisive. They wanted annihilation. And that was the word that he used. So, in fact, the battle itself, albeit important strategically and in terms of sort of fending off any um, ideas of invasion by Napoleon, I mean, there's, that's, that's been doubted a little, but there's no doubt that it was an important battle because there was no such important battle fought by the Royal Navy until the Battle of Jutland of 1916. And I will come back to that because I do feel, having read through the material that Ruskin has written specifically on the Navy Nation and Trafalgar and Nelson. And I do feel that Ruskin, and obviously at the time he wouldn't have known this in the mid 19th century because this text I'm looking at are very much from the, the 1856 moment, which is again, pretty crucial. But I do feel quite strongly that Ruskin was absorbing a lot of the, of the history and perception of that specific battle and the outcome. And of course, the big outcome from that battle was the death of Nelson um, and how that was commemorated and, and memorialized from 1805 up to the moment when Ruskin is writing very much in that, in that subject. Um, but also how he might have fed into a kind of national denial about the changes that were happening in society, the changes that were happening globally in terms of Britain's position on the world stage as a sort of global leader, but also I think perceptions of how technology, which of course is very much part of what Ruskin was looking at and certainly Turner responded to, and in turn Ruskin responded to Turner, is that actually there was a kind of national expectation or over expectation about what was going to happen next and this actually I think Ruskin was feeding into with the way he wrote about Nelson Trafalgar and Turner's responses to it and the quote that I actually have here one haunting conception yeah. I have to project a bit more then yeah okay Great. and how the writings of ruskin especially if they are very in my god does it get turned up or anything turned it up so it should be. i think it's just a matter of getting closer to the, to the mic which is maybe the yeah. Gosh, <laughs> I don't think it is, is it? It's not picking up at all. Hmm. It's on. Um, I could shout. Shall I shout? <laughs> yeah, that might be worth trying this. Yeah, this is, see if this makes any yeah. No, I'm literally on. Yeah. Maybe try that. See if that helps. Okay. 
So I'll carry on. I'll keep going. I'll keep going. So, um, so the two texts that I'm going to be looking at today that forms the centre of this talk is the Harbours of England, the essay that uh, Ruskin wrote um, for a publication around a series of engravings by Turner, and that was first published in 1856. And then I'm going to move on to notes on the Turner Gallery of Marlborough House, which was published as an unofficial catalogue to the first exhibition of paintings from the Turner Bequest, about, I think it was 34 paintings, which opened in late 1856. And the pamphlet itself written by Ruskin was issued on the 12th of January, 1857. And I would really recommend, if you haven't done it already, to read the Harbours of England essay and then move straight on to the notes on the Turner Gallery, um, because Ruskin himself actually talks about, he actually refers in the second publication to the first publication, but I think also he saw it as building on his own work from modern painters from 1843, where he was very much concentrating on um, uh, painting the sea as, a, as an element. This is building on the idea of painting of shipping, of marine painting and so on. And it's really worth reading both of those texts, one after the other, to see how he's building up his argument. Now, as Bill mentioned, the National Gallery, I don't know if anyone doesn't know this, is, is celebrating its bicentenary. So this particular subject, although you might not think it's immediately relevant to the National Gallery, is actually absolutely central to the institution, and not just through Ruskin and Turner, who of course are intimately connected to the history of the National Gallery. Um, the National Gallery was um, founded in 1824 in the post-Napoleonic War period. That actually is very significant in terms of the whole tone of the institution, its direction of travel, and so on. So it was a very patriotic, patriotic outcome on some level, but it was also a desire to set up a national collection that was freely accessible to the public that could actually influence contemporary art. And of course, this is absolutely central to what Ruskin was trying to do. There's also the proximity, of course, to Trafalgar Square. That is also significant to the National Gallery, and I'll come on to that in a moment. But Trafalgar Square itself, if we remember, is not just commemorating the Napoleonic War and Nelson and Trafalgar um, specifically, it also is a war memorial to the First World War and the Second World War. It's an absolute focus on the Navy at Trafalgar Square, which goes over a, a century and a half. So that's a very important element to it. There are memorials to Admiral um, Jellicoe and Beatty and also Cunningham who cover that First and Second World War period. The second thing, I, um, other thing I want to point out is that the Wilkins Building itself, which was completed in the late 1830s, housed the National Gallery and the Royal Academy, and that would continue for 30 years. So the Turner, as a Royal Academician, overlapped with the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood as Academy students for, well, since 1848, for the last part of Turner's career. And it's important, actually, when we come to something like the Fighting Temeraire, that actually it was exhibited in the Wilkins Building in 1839 as Trafalgar Square was being laid out. And the other element, of course, which is absolutely central to the National Gallery is that, you know, the, is the Turner bequest itself and Turner's desire in, in his will of 1829 to have two of his paintings exhibited alongside Claude. And we'll come on to that in a moment. But of course, there was um, the will was contested by Turner's um, relatives. And from 1851, the death of Turner, to 1856, this dispute went on, but it was finally um, resolved. And of course, the rest, as they say, is history in terms of this colossal collection of autographed uh, works by Turner that is, remains by some distance the largest donation of an artist's work to the National Gallery, possibly anywhere indeed in the United Kingdom. And the, and the fighting term is actually central to Ruskin's thinking. Um, it was certainly central to Turner's thinking, and it was incorporated into the first exhibition of the bequest paintings at Marlborough House in 1856. 
Now, given the fame of the fighting Temeraire in the present, it's perhaps unsurprising that when the National Gallery actually formulated some projects around the bicentenary, that it would actually select the fighting Temeraire alongside the Hay Wayne by John Constable to act as a mini National Gallery of greatest hits, the iconic works of the National Gallery, to then go round the home nations and regions of the, of the United Kingdom to celebrate the National Collection. And what was interesting about what happened in Newcastle, who received the Fighting Temeraire, and again, just thinking through what I'm about to say in terms of Ruskin's words, let alone um, the intentions of Turner as an artist, is that the, the painting, of course, went to Newcastle with a very rich history of coal and shipbuilding. And it caused that shipbuilding included vessels for the Royal Navy. And I'll come back to this because their focus on art, industry and nostalgia, which of course was the name of their exhibition, to some extent is a cliche of a response to the fighting Temeraire. However, by the close of this lecture, I hope that you'll see that in fact, it was entirely justified, but also I think almost called up the spirit of both Ruskin and Turner in terms of the sort of local or regional history that they were really drawing out. So as I said earlier, there's a sort of autobiographical or career context to what I'm about to say in terms of the projects that I've been working on. And I mentioned, of course, Ruskin Turner, the Pre-Raphaelites, um, the exhibition in 2000 at Tate Gallery, which um, of course, Robert Hewson was the lead curator, who inspired it and so on. And this, of course, celebrated the centenary of John Ruskin's death, which reminded us, if we needed reminding, that Ruskin was not only a great polymath and tremendously influential in so many different directions um, in, as I said, art, culture and, uh, and uh, society, um, but he was also the first critic to make a reputation by championing contemporary art, first in his defense of Turner in Modern Painters, and then by giving his decisive support to the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. And indeed, as Robert actually noted um, in his introduction to the exhibition catalogue, um, that it's what Ruskin defended by these artists that was important. What, what the defense, of it, what is important is what Ruskin chose to defend these artists for. What is it that they were doing? And a key word for him, of course, was truth and the kind of phrases that we often hear about Ruskin, truth to nature, but also as Ruskin argued himself, that there, and I quote, is a moral as well as a material truth, a truth of impression as well as of form, of thought as well as matter. And as I said earlier, this, I think Ruskin felt, and he certainly talks about this in his letters and also in the Harbour of, of, of England um, introduction, is what he, what he, he was actually in, in, when Turner dies, he actually thinks about writing a biography um, of Turner, decided that it wasn't really suited to him, the format of biography, and then felt that actually a lot of what he had to say about Turner was coming through in his publications, particularly uh, modern painters. But actually what was being given here in terms of the commission that he received to write the essay, particularly for uh, the harbors of England, was an opportunity to really expand on what he'd already started, as it were, in his approach to Turner as a painter of the sea. And then I think the other element that I'd like to sort of flag and when, we, when we, we come to it is that the 1850s in particular is a very, very proactive, very productive decade for Ruskin in a number of directions. Of course, we have the publication of pre raphaelitism in 1851. We also have Stones of Venice in 1851 to three. We have two further volumes, in fact, of modern painters. Um, and I think it's in, uh, the, just wanted to sort of quote from um, Robert once again about the Stones of Venice is that, um, again, from the exhibition catalogue, that the Stones of Men Venice is as much, is about much more than stones. It is an argument about the rise, decline, and fall of empires that Ruskin applied to the England of his day. And of course, it really is important, therefore, just to think that through in terms of how Turner then represents something like the Battle of Trafalgar, something like the death of Nelson, how important it is then to think that through in terms of the rise and fall of empires. Now, perhaps disappointingly, um, the film uh, Mr. Turner in 2014 by Mike Lee, my twin sister worked on this film, by the way, so um, don't tell her what I just said, 
was that actually there was no direct discussion about the National Gallery, the formation of the National Gallery, or specifically Turner's desire to have two of his paintings shown in conjunction with Claude Lorraine. However, as this scene um, of the film um, actually did broach the subject of Turner and Claude, very importantly, um, Oh, you just, no worries, no worries. So that the desire of Turner to be shown alongside Claude wasn't specifically mentioned in the, the film Mr. Turner by Mike Lee, which was, uh, which was uh, in, is of um, 2014. Um, but this scene, I think, is very important in terms of evoking that juxtaposition of an artist of the past with the artist of the present, and actually very much central to what Ruskin was trying to do from modern painters onwards. So in this scene, after a discussion about gooseberries, and anyone that's seen the film will know what I'm talking about, um, Ruskin, played by Joshua Maguire, who you can see um, at the top of the screen there, proposes a topic for discussion, and I quote, the question as to the depiction of the seas and the oceans in pictorial art, which gets a grunt from Turner. If you've seen the film, Turner does a lot of grunting in this film. Um, after which Ruskin continues that he finds himself, quote, harboring perhaps rather a perhaps rather controversial opinion reg regarding the long deceased Claude, and that he finds his Claude that is rendering of C rather insipid, dull and uninspiring. To which Turner says, Claude was a man of his time. And then Ruskin says, my point exactly, Mr. Turner, but that time is long past. And although this is said in a kind of effete, slightly um, lispy kind of way, it is an important element, I think, of what I'm about to say, because obviously the harbours of England ranges around historically, art historically. Claude is, um, comes in for some of Ruskin's eye, particularly van der Velde, um, the artist that, of course, Turner alongside Claude was responding to, particularly in his early career. And after um, Ruskin says, um, my point exactly, Mr. Turner, but that time is long past. Ruskin's expre uh, Turner's expression is this, and he says, Lord was a genius. However, later on, um, we, rather interestingly, with the scene showing the fighting Temeraire, it is a wonderful enactment of the Temeraire coming up the Thames um, to be broken up at Rotherhithe. Um, it's, it reenacts the largely apocryphal story. Firstly, that Turner would have seen the fighting Temeraire coming up the Thames at this point, that in fact, Clarkson Stanfield, the marine painter, the younger um, marine painter who was shown in that first clip that I showed from Mr. Turner, was the one who suggested the fighting Temeraire subject. But they then move on to an interesting brief conversation where Clarkson Stanfield expresses his regret at the loss of the fighting Temeraire, a ghost of the past, he says to Turner. But Turner says the past is past. The future is smoke, iron and steam, suggesting that in fact Turner was quite happy for the past to be where it was and to move forward and perhaps was an, an evocation of his embracing of the modern world, but also perhaps that actually he was continually wanting to drive his art forward. His inspiration from the old masters came not in mimicking them, and I think Ruskin makes that point, but rather to take them as a point of departure, which is a point I think that's being made in the film. So the Harbours of England, as I mentioned, um, was pub first published in this format in 1856, but in fact, it was an old project from the 1820s, um, originally going to be titled the Harbours of England, but in fact, ended up being published as the Ports of England. And I think I've got a theory around why that might be, which actually is patriotic. Um, 
So a series of watercolours and then Mexican engravings, which was initiated by the engraver and publisher Thomas Goff Lupton. And as it turned out, a much more ambitious project of over 20 engravings and watercolours commissioned from Turner ended up being three parts, two engravings in 1826, two in 1827, and two in 1828. So in some senses, what happened in 1856 was a revival of a project that was never completed, some sort of semblance of what was originally conceived by Lupton and Turner. And Ruskin's reasons for taking up the commission of writing the um, essay at the beginning of this publication is actually extremely interesting because he talks about the fact that um, um, Turner connected or arranged works of art in, in groups, in connected groups, a series of drawings, something that actually had a kind of sequential quality to it. He also said that the title of the Harbours of England and the grouping of the works of art was, quote, merely out of respect to this habit of Turner. So again, this idea of Turner creating sequence of images that kind of related to each other. He also said, quote, that he wanted to um, that he has some remarks that he wished to make on Turner's green painting in general. And in fact, as I said before, he embraces something far more than that, uh, the history and, uh, of history and art history, and that he actually wanted to evoke the general system of ship painting, which was characteristic of this great artist, i.e. Turner. He also noted rather pointedly, another reason for him writing, that, it, that, the, that he, the offer came at a moment when much nonsense in various forms was being written about Turner and his works. So again, um, um, Ruskin coming in to save the day, as it were, in terms of Turner's reputation. And I think um, just to note that actually the response to um, his, his essay in particular, one, a very uh, quite famous review in the Athenaeum where um, unusually, the Athenaeum is very supportive and very um, admiring of, of uh, Ruskin's essay, that they actually likens it to the Ode to the Ocean, um, which obviously forms part of Child Howell's Pilgrimage by Byron. And again, I think, what, I think what they were suggesting in the review is that Ruskin actually does in prose what Byron did in poetry, but also talks through from the perception of the Athenaeum reviewer that what um, Ruskin did was really lay out the, almost like a, a, a synopsis of the maritime nation and Britain as a maritime nation, but also really focused on issues around patriotism and, and the idea of poetry. And I'm showing you this vignette because it is the, the vignette itself was by Turner, but was actually owned by John Ruskin and he donated this to the Fitzwilliam in 1861. So throughout the essay on the harbours of, of England, Ruskin really notes how, how Turner's knowledge and understanding of ships and shipping from humble fishing boats through colliers, through to the great ships of the line and the warships of the, of the um, British Navy. He acknowledged that um, in the essay, but also in response to the images themselves. But one reason why I think people were pulling out the patriotism of this particular series of engravings, and indeed the patriotism of Ruskin's response, is that the initial project itself has meant to certainly been commented upon, has, was in response to the Ports of England series, uh, sorry, the Ports of France series, painted by uh, Claude Joseph Vernet for Louis XV in the mid 18th century. So even there, the change of title from harbors to ports might have been a quite deliberate response to this series. Um, a very famous series from the mid 18th century. And of course, it wasn't the only series that Turner was involved in in the 1820s and 1830s. It was, of course, the, the harbours of England, um, the rivers of England, as it was originally titled, was very much overlapping with another series of images um, which um, came under the title of the rivers of England. So, in fact, there is actually around the 1820s and 1830s, as Ruskin recognizes, this real drive by Turner to really promote, to, to create sequence of images that relate to each other. And I have to say, 
that it's become such a part of the way that um, curators and writers actually think about Turner's work. So that actually I myself, when we did the Turner and the Sea exhibition at the National Maritime Museum in 2013, actually created triptychs and groupings of works of art, whether or not Turner intended them ever to be seen together, because we really felt that actually grouping them in this way, sort of in some senses inspired by John Ruskin's comments, that actually there was a way of actually thinking through how Turner returns to a subject, including, for example, in the 18, 1801 to 1810, a sequence of spectacular large-scale seascapes on the left-hand side of the screen, um, the wreck of the transport ship from the Gulbenkian, in the centre, Calais Pier from the National Gallery, and on the right, the shipwreck, which is now in the Tate's collection. And actually, we also, in the exhibition of 2013, grouped these three paintings together very deliberately, I did it very deliberately, in response to the writings of John Ruskin and just thinking through how he had commented on the fact that not only in the Stones of Venice, and you can see a scene of Venice on the left-hand side, how that was a commentary on the rise and fall of empires, juxtaposed with the Kielman on the right-hand side, which is now in the collection of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, as a kind of thrusting, modern, contemporary, industrialized nation and empire of Britain, but with the fighting temeraire in the center as a kind of corrective, as it were, to think that if the British thought that they were always going to be on the rise, as it were, in terms of their empire, that there was always Venice, as this example, this very Ruskinian approach to Venice. It was always Venice to, to act as a kind of corrective to this idea that the, the sun would never set on the British Empire. So I myself actually did the same thing as a triptych in an exhibition format. And Turner himself did the same thing, of course. He um, um, actually exhibited these two works in 1839, The Fighting Temeraire, and again, juxtaposing the contemporary world of the changing transition period for the British with modern day Rome, the rise and again, rise and fall of empires. So I mentioned before that a significant element of the exhibition of, the, of uh, Fighting Temeraire in 1839 was the fact that it was the first year that the Royal Academy were exhibiting uh, in, in the same building as the National Gallery with the laying out of Trafalgar Square from the 1830s into the 1840s. And this would have been a very new um, focus for the rising imperial capital of Rome to have Trafalgar Square with Nelson's column, which of course was finished by 1845, a new element, I suppose, for Ruskin to respond to in his writings, and indeed, I think, re-energized the idea of Trafalgar in art. Now, what I'm showing in the center bottom there is Carew's Death of Nelson at Trafalgar. Now, I don't, you know, if you ever Google the death of Nelson, my goodness, so much will come up in terms of um, pictorial arts, starting with, um, for example, in, in just after the battle itself in 1806, we have Benjamin West, the death of Nelson, which was almost immediately uh, produced as an engraving, which proved to be extremely popular. But just on the other side of 1856 with the harbors of England, you actually have the commission by, of, um, by the Houses of Parliament, um, for the Palace of Westminster of two absolutely colossal representations of the Battle of Trafalgar and the Battle of Waterloo, which was destined for the Royal Gallery um, on the House of Lords side of the Palace of Westminster. So again, this was a subject area that had seemed to have no, there were no signs of it slowing down really in terms of the reactions of, the, of art and culture and society in the period itself. And this is in some senses, I think, part of what Ruskin's thinking about when he's writing about Turner's response to Trafalgar it's, itself. And it's not even as if over and above the death of Nelson himself, which is such a, an enormous subject area in British art uh, for the first, certainly the first half of the 19th century, um, but it's also the battle itself. So in 1836, we have Clarkson Stanfield uh, creating an, again, an enormous representation of the Battle of Trafalgar, um, specifically for um, uh, commissioned by the United Service Club, which is now the Institute of Directors on Pall Mall. And this was exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1836. So Turner's response in 1839, I'm sure, had 
Clarkson and Stanfield's representation in mind. But I just wanted to show you the fact that it isn't just the British who are responding to the Battle of Trafalgar. Lower right, we have an example of a French artist. I mean, this was a colossal defeat for the French, but nonetheless, it didn't stop French artists and, you know, being commissioned or creating works of art that then would go on exhibition in Paris and elsewhere. And then finally, just, just before Ruskin starts writing in the harbours of England, um, we have Clarkson Stanfield again doing, uh, in, in effect, an homage really to Turner as well as Trafalgar through actually the representation of victory, the, the HMS victory, the flagship of Vice Admiral Nelson, towing, uh, being towed into Gibraltar with um, Nelson's body on board. But I think the motif of a, a ship of the line, a, a warship being towed, as it were, I think would be just as much um, evocative of Turner's highly successful and much admired fighting Temeraire post-1839 as indeed the battle itself. So again, this is another a, a work of art that's being exhibited two years after the death of um, Turner in 1853, just prior, of course, to Ruskin's um, writing about um, writing about um, um, uh, Rusk, uh, Turner's harbours of England. Right. So, as this all indicates. Um, there was no absence in British visual culture of representations of ship and shipping, and indeed naval vessels, whether associated with Trafalgar or other naval events. So this could be in fleet action song, but also, I think importantly, the representation of um, warships as guard ships, as hulks, as prison ships and so on would have been around the coast of the United Kingdom, especially the southern coast of the United Kingdom, very familiar and equally familiar if you didn't make it to the coast in exhibitions at the British Institution or indeed at the Royal Academy and elsewhere. Um, the hulks that you can see on the left hand side would simply be a matter and every a fact of everyday life for a maritime nation. And then representations, for example, of the Temeraire in the centre there by Edward William Cook, again, just shows you that these ships were actually very much part of the culture, the visual culture of the United Kingdom. And hence why I think Turner's very unusual, very elegiac and poetic response, and certainly from Ruskin's perspective, was quite different from what other people were doing at the time. And I think you're probably getting a sense of that just by looking through um, um, these images. Now, the other thing, um, the other element of this, though, that I think is very important in thinking about um, Ruskin is that Ruskin had called, had, had defended the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood on the basis that he thought that they were on the brink of being a new and noble school in England. But interestingly, he actually harbored hopes and even set down a challenge in the harbors of England around a similar attitude towards the nation and maritime art. And he actually says, and I quote, it has often been a matter of serious thought to me how far this chiefly substantial thing done by the nation, either the maritime nation, ought to be represented by the art of the nation. How far our great artists ought seriously to devote themselves to such perfect painting of our ships as should reveal to later generations lost perhaps in clouds of steam and floating troughs of ashes, the aspects of an ancient ship of battle under sail. And then he goes on to say something extremely interesting in terms of what is noble art and what is ignoble art. He says, to which I fear the answer must be sternly this, that no great art ever was or can be employed in the careful imitation of the work of man as its principal subject. That is to say, art will not bear to be replicated or reduplicated. A ship is a noble thing and a cathedral is a noble thing. And that juxtaposition of ship and cathedral, I think is very important. But a painted ship or a painted cathedral is not a noble thing. Art which re reduplicates art is necessarily second rate art. And of course, second rate is also a class of warship, which I think is very interesting. I know no principle more irre irrefutably authoritative than that which I had long ago occasion to express 
All noble art is the expression of man's delight in God's work, not in his own. And then he goes on to a very important element, I think, in terms of the reception of the fighting Temeraire in particular. For in this respect, a ruined building is a noble subject, just as far as man's work has therein been subdued by nature. For a wrecked ship or shattered ship is a noble subject, while a ship in full sail or a perfect boat is an ignoble one not merely because the one is by reason of its ruin more picturesque than the other, but because it is a nobler act in man to mediate, to meditate upon fate as it conquers his work than upon that work itself. So just a few words then on the Turner bequest. Um, and this is a representation on the top there of the exhibition that was held at the National Gallery in 2012 that really focused on the Turner bequest itself. And of course, I mentioned before about the fact that Turner wanted to be shown with two works by Claude. You have the mill and uh, the embarkation of the Queen of Sheba on the left, and then grouped with two of his works. And he did change his mind, which is actually represented on the wall of the back. He had the rise of the Carthaginian Empire, Dido building Carthage, and then the decline of the Carthaginian Empire. But he decided later on to actually uh, replace that with sun rising through vapor, which is on the right hand side. So I think Turner, it's important that Turner actually decided in 1829, as early as 1829, to actually have this juxtaposition of himself with Claude. And I think in part, and I think this might have chimed with um, Ruskin's thinking, um, that in 1824, with the original acquisition of paintings, 36 works of art that formed the National Gallery's collection through the, um, the um, collection of uh, John Julius Angerstein, that these works actually included um, a series of uh, Marriage à la Mode by Hogarth, a portrait by Reynolds, and indeed a work of art by David Wilkie, who actually died in 1841. So I think his inspiration for thinking this through was to insert himself into the national, as it were, national collection and the national history of art as represented at Trafalgar Square. But when it comes to um, Ruskin's response to uh, the paintings on exhibition in Marlborough House in late 1851, he actually talks through how Turner's career could be subdivided into four sections. The early career is very much, um, you know, responding to the old masters and slightly, slightly sort of weighed down, as it were, by the trammels of the um, academic system. The second phase where he starts to break free from that and sort of emerge and test things out in terms of his, his role as an artist, as a sort of artist of inspiration, dealing particularly, of course, with his observation of nature. And then the third period where he really comes into his own, where he throws off the trammels of the old masters and really engage with nature, um, as it were, the truth to nature. And then the final period is one of decline, the last few years of Turner's life before he dies in 1851. And then interestingly, having sort of talked through this idea of Turner's career, he then bookends 1829 with 1839 as the kind of supreme decade of Turner's working career as an artist, with of course, Ulysses deriding Polyphemus on the left-hand side and the fighting Temeraire on the right. And he described Polyphemus um, in his uh, notes on the Turner Gallery, because that, that's one of the paintings that was included, that the Polyphemus asserts Turner's perfect power and is therefore to be considered as the central picture in Turner's career. And it is some sort of a type of destiny, um, some sort of type of his own destiny. And what he then goes on to say later on in the harbors uh, is to relate this comment back to the harbors of England when he actually comments on the fighting Temeraire as the last painting that Turner did, as, and I quote, that was executed with his perfect power. And then he then goes on to just sort of set out why it is that he's chosen these two paintings to sort of be so emblematic of Turner's power as an artist, because he considers them to be because he considers the period to be central to Turner's power, but it was entirely developed and entirely unabated, unlike the previous periods. 
And then he began the Ulysses and closed with the Temeraire, which he himself actually discusses in terms of sunrise and sunset. That there you have on the one hand the rise of a career, so he relates it directly to Turner, the rise of a career, and then, the, as it were, the setting sun on a career. The idea of entering on a voyage and then the closing of the voyage itself, the closing its course forever. And he actually says that perhaps it's a little bit fanciful that Turner himself might not have done this, but nonetheless to think of these actually almost as representative of Turner as a painter and a person, someone going through a great period of, of, of his prime, through to decline, through the representations of the ships. And we'll come back to that in a moment, the idea of the ship representing a human life. But also in the harbours of England, um, Ruskin really interestingly creates almost like a microcosm, a group of works, again, working on the basis that that's what Ruskin did, uh, Turner did, that he actually selected works of art as a kind of sequence, as a kind of mini, um, almost like a retrospective, I suppose, of Turner's work as a marine painter. He starts with Lord Yarborough's shipwreck, the one I mentioned before, the wreck of the transport ship, which is now in the Gulbenkian. He then moves on to the Trafalgar at Greenwich Hospital um, from 1822 to 24. He then goes back in time to the early Trafalgar, which is part of the Turner bequest. He then mentions um, what we now call Now for the Painter, which was exhibited in 1827, which he calls the Pas de Calais, which is another um, title for it. He then talks about um, the large Cologne from 1826, which is now in the Frick's collection. And then he mentions Le Havre. Now, I don't think anyone's actually identified what that painting was. I'm sure Ruskin never got anything wrong, and he didn't mean the Dieppe on the lower part, which was exhibited in 1825. But I'm not sure that anyone's found out what the, the Havre was, number six. And then, of course, he moves on to the fighting Temeraire. Well, what's interesting to me is that three out of seven of those paintings are his Turner's Trafalgar paintings. The early Trafalgar painting, the Battle of Trafalgar is seen from the mizzen starboard shrouds of the victory, then moving on to the Battle of Trafalgar, which was a commission, um, royal commission from George IV, and, and, and um, actually exhibited in St. James's Palace as part of a commemorative scheme, a, a memorial scheme of 1824, same year the National Gallery was founded. And then, of course, the fighting Temeraire itself. And this is what uh, Ruskin actually said in um, the notes on the Turner Gallery, and I quote. He says that the Temeraire was the last of a group of pictures painted at different times, but all illustrative of one haunting conception of the central struggle at Trafalgar. The first was, I believe, that exhibited in the British Institution in 1808, at the Battle of Trafalgar is seen from the Mission Shrouds of the Victory. It is a magnificent picture in his early manner, and it is a nation, in the nation's possession, and ought surely have been exhibited in the series instead of the Calais Pier, which is at the National Gallery, being remarkable in many ways, but chiefly for its endeavour to give the spectator a complete map of everything visible in the ship's victory and redoubtable, or redoubtable at the moment of Nelson's death wound. Then came the Trafalgar, then came the Trafalgar, now at Greenwich Hospital, representing the victory after the battle. A picture which, for my own part, though said to have been spoilt by ill-advised compliances on Turner's part with requests for alterations, and they tended to come from naval officers, by the way, he was sort of continually trying to get him to change it. I would rather, including actually the future William IV, actually, um, who was the so-called Sailor King, actually um, served with um, Nelson. I would rather have than anyone in the national collection Lastly came this Temeraire, which is the best memorial that Turner could give to the ship, which was the victory's companion in her closing strife. So those are the three Trafalgar paintings. So then I suppose one question I have is really, why did Ruskin at this moment in 1856-7, why did he choose these three paintings amongst the, of the seven to really focus upon. 
And I think this really comes down to this very important line in the harbours of England, where he says, and I quote, um, but as it is none of these things will be hereafter considered to have been got on with by as well as might be said, whereas it will always be said of us with unabated reverence, they built ships of the line. So this is the line I think that's really critical in the harbours of England as far as um, Trafalgar and the, the Navy is concerned. And actually some description, of course, of what we mean by ship of the line is important because actually we're in a transition period in the 1850s, moving from the age of sail into the age of steam. And of course, we'll then move on to a different period later on in the century. Now, in, in essence, the ship of the line, of course, is a type of naval warship constructed during the age of sail from the 17th century through to the mid 19th century. And the ship of the line was designed for naval tactic known as the line of battle, which involved the two columns of opposing warships maneuvering to a volley fire with cannon along their broadsides. And of course, broadsides something that we use in the present. In conflicts where opposing ships were both able to fire from their broadsides, the faction with more um, cannon fire and therefore more firepower typically had an advantage. So on the top you see a representation of the Battle of Trafalgar, on the bottom a representation um, of um, the, the, the Battle of Cullilore. Now that actually just very, very neatly sets out what we mean by ships of the line. They're literally lining up and firing at each other. Now on the right hand side you can see the map um, showing the chart, showing the, the uh, British fleet on the left hand side approaching the, the battle lines, as it were, of the combined um, French and Spanish fleet. So this is all entirely reliant, of course, on wind. There's no self-propulsion here. This is something that's entirely about the age of sail. And Ruskin even goes on to actually talk about, um, and I quote, it is not often that I congratulate myself upon the days in which I happen to live, but I do so in this respect, that compared with every other period of the world, this 19th century, or rather the period between 1750 and 1850, may not improperly be called the age of boats. And I think what um, Ruskin is doing there is sort of leading the century up to his own times, but choosing a moment really when the British Navy was deemed to be you know, on the rise, you know, becoming one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful Navy in the world, and hence the importance of the ships of the line as a symbol of nation and Navy. And of course, the fighting temeraire exhibited in 1839 is coming towards the end of that period, the idea of the rise and fall, as it were, of the ship of the line. Now, Turner, as we know, really embraced um, the modern world, some of his most famous works of art feature steamboat travel, for example, which have been certainly going since the 1820s. Um, but actually, um, Ruskin, I think, shows a degree of nostalgia himself, perhaps, about these um, sort of technolo technological changes. But perhaps what he's really responding to is how that's going to affect art, how that's going to affect the representation of the sea and indeed marine painting more broadly. But of course, as I said, we are very much in a period of transition, hence um, not only steamboat travel for passengers, but also the warships themselves. So from the end of the 1840s, for example, um, the introduction of steam power brought less dependence on wind, as I said, in battle in particular, and led to the construction of screw-driven wooden hulled ships of the line. A number of uh, sail-powered ships were converted to this propulsion um, this propulsion mechanism. And one example of that, in fact, is the Royal Albert on the right hand side, which was actually laid and launched as um, a, a ship of the line through sail, but then was converted into a screw steamer. So even during this period of sort of 1854, which is when the um, Royal Albert was launched as a steam um, ship of the line, this is just before uh, Turner um, Ruskin writing in 1856. And I should, I think it's worth also pointing out that actually we're talking about the period of the Crimean War and a very important battle that occurs during that period, the Battle of Sinopol, Sinopol of 1853, which was a naval battle that took place on the 30th of November 
between the imper Imperial Russia and the Ottoman Empire. And this is during the opening phase of the Crimean War. So the Russian Navy had recently adopted naval artillery that fires explosive shells, which gave them a decisive action in the battle, a decisive advantage in the battle. And at the same time, not only do we have the launch of HMS Royal Albert, but in 1850, the French launched Napoleon, which was the first um, steam battleship, and then later launched um, the, the Gloire or Glory in 1857. And by which point, I think the writing was on the wall in terms of ships of the line driven by sail, was that they were actually becoming obsolete. And that became even more emphatically true, of course, with the development of HMS Dreadnought, which was launched in 1906. And it's interesting here that they're juxtaposing the past of 1805 with victory and then 1906 with the present, that is, Dreadnought. So actually, I think perhaps there are a number of things to underline here in terms of uh, Ruskin's spirited um, defense of Turner's second battle of Trafalgar of 1822 to 23. Um, four, which by the time he goes to Greenwich Hospital has now been donated by George IV as part of the new Naval um, Gallery of Art, which actually opened before the National Gallery in 1824, so it pipped us by a couple of weeks. And the, the painted hall, of course, um, was a, a decorative interior by James Thornhill um, in the enormous hall that formed part of, the, of Greenwich Hospital itself that came out of um, um, Queen Mary, who had seen injured um, sailors, um, both uh, members of the officers and also the um, ordinary seamen, coming out of battles of the 1690s to actually set up a hospital in order to look after them. And actually, it's very much a symbol, I think, of the emerging and increasing power of the Royal Navy during the 18th century and beyond. So in fact, contrary to popular belief, the idea that the controversy around Turner's representation of the Battle of Trafalgar, much complained about by naval officers and ordinary seamen, um, in fact, the idea that it was kind of banished to Greenwich in 1829 by George IV, in fact, is entirely untrue. But any residual complaints about the representation of the battle from a naval perspective, of course, um, Ruskin very famously um, evokes in his um, um, uh, Harbours of England essay, which I'll come on into a moment. And Turner, of course, was responding to a specific commission to paint a work of art for an existing work of art by de Lutherberg, which would then go to St. James's Palace. So in fact, the painting itself had been created for an entirely different context. And then it moves to Greenwich because George IV essentially wanted to involve himself, whether it's the Waterloo Chamber at uh, Windsor Castle or indeed um, the Palace of Westminster and then moving on to Greenwich. He really was very proactively involved in all the commemorative schemes that came out of the Napoleonic War period. So this is the painted hall itself. Some 300 paintings um, by the time it was finished, um, lining the painted hall, all about the glory of the Navy, about the, the, the um, officers, about the actions, about um, you know, just everything really encapsulating, as it were, through art, the history of the Royal Navy from the Armada to the present day. This is not consigning Turner's painting to oblivion in Greenwich. This was a very, very important um, project. And um, in 1845, it would have received an enormous boost um, in terms of um, Nelsonic memorabilia, um, and, and one might even say um, um, sort of almost the, the really iconic elements of the collection at Greenwich through the donation of Prince Albert of um, Vice Admiral Nelson's um, undress coat that he wore when he was shot on the deck of Victory in 1805. So this is a very important element of the kind of relics, as it were, of Nelson that started to accrue at Greenwich as part of the scheme. And on the right hand side, if only to underline how um, much the imagery of the Greenwich pensions were actually part of Brit British visual culture in the centre of London, this painting by Andrew Morton of the United Service showing the Chelsea and Greenwich pensioners in the Painted Hall was exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1845.
So the Painted Hall was a site of commemoration, celebration, memorialization, and it was a very important center for this whole evocation of Nelson, Navy, and nation. And I suppose it then is in that context is quite interesting that one of um, Ruskin's original um, paragraphs in the Harbours of England, in fact, the editor decided to remove it in part, I think, because it was deemed to be very detrimental and, dis, you know, as it were, unnecessarily critical and undermining of Greenwich Hospital and the um, painted, the, the Naval Gallery of, um, of Art. And this, I think, is a, a, something that was reproduced, um, this has been reduced several times, that actually underscores the fact that this removal might have been quite timely and, and, and diplomatic, because, um, because, as Ruskin says here, that this particular sentence was sacrificed to the muse of prudence, in part because it was thought that Greenwich Hospital um, was so prestigious and so much a landmark, as it were, um, in terms of um, British art, you know, art and culture, that actually to have Ruskin sort of expounding on his, um, on his sort of, you know, his, his favorite artist and a work of art that he really promoted. I mean, I, I, sometimes I actually wonder why it was that Ruskin really supported the idea of the Battle of Trafalgar, the second one, given um, the kind of maelstrom around it in terms of its commentary on how factual it was and how representation it was. But that might be the point. Ruskin yet again stepping in and promoting and supporting a work of art like Snowstorm Steamboat over Harper's Mouth, for example, which, um, which of course, was also um, um, came under the ire of the, of the critics in 1842. So it might just be a matter of Ruskin stepping in again. So the editor in the publication of 1895, have I got another sort of 10 minutes? Again, I had to sort of, um, 1895, um, the expression of an, he said that, the, the, talking about Ruskin's comments about, um, and, I, and I quote, a picture which at a moderate estimate is simply worth all the rest of the hospital grounds, walls, pictures, and models put together, that the editor of the preface of the, public, the Harbours of England when it was published in 1895 said that the expression of an opinion which heaped praise upon the single painting of a partially understood artist at the expense of a great and popular institution would only have served to arouse opposition and possibly to attract ridicule. And then the editor said, well, of course, it's different today, uh, commenting in 1895. And that's the full passage that um, Ruskin writes. Now, Ruskin, just to end then, Ruskin, Ruskin's defense of Turner in terms of his accuracy, so it's because what I sorry didn't say is that this is the famous encounter between Ruskin and a pensioner in Greenwich Hospital, where Ruskin actually imitates the language of the old sailor. Perhaps we should ignore that for one moment and just think through what he was saying in terms of the idea of accuracy versus a more poetic response to the Battle of Trafalgar itself. And I think that's the nub of what Ruskin's trying to say is that actually accuracy is all very well, but what is it art? Is it noble art? And going back to that quote that I made before about the idea of, of, of ruin, um, the ruined representation of something made by man is a noble subject. And I think that's what Ruskin was trying to get to in this passage in the harbors of England. And he evokes again and again how Turner was very experienced at, um, of, experienced in, in naval architecture, in painting ships. You know, he produced this um, um, watercolor, which is again mentioned in the harbors of England in terms of the first rates taking in stores. It's a very famous watercolor by Turner. And I think partly what he's responding to is the fact that when people did actually get their hands on um, engraving the Fighting Temeraire in 1845, rather famously, if you look on the left-hand side, the funnel of the steamship has actually moved back in the position that they would be in reality. And there was a lot of moaning, of course, from people supportive of Turner's decision to make that change to reality. 
to create something that's more balanced as a work of art, which was then corrected on the right-hand side in the engraving when it accompanied uh, Ralph Nicholson Wernham's um, uh, publication of a series of, I think it was some 60 engravings, including the Fighting Tamara. You can see on the right-hand side um, that actually the funnel has gone back into the position where Turner had painted in the original painting. And it's important here because Wernham himself is not just a, an artist, art historian and administrator, but he was also the keeper and secretary of the National Gallery of London until his death in 1877. So while you might think that uh, Ruskin's um, sort, of quoting, sort of quoting the sort of nautical language of the Greenwich pensioner might come across as slightly patronizing, um, Ruskin himself actually made it very clear in his notes on the um, Turner Gallery that Turner respected and admired seamen. And I quote, the work which thus nobly closes the series, that is the Fighting Temeraire, is a solemn expression of a sympathy with seamen and with ships with, 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 which has been one of the governing emotions in Turner's mind throughout his life. And I'm just showing you here some examples of the kind of representations of ordinary soldiers, ordinary sailors, that again very much became part of Britain's visual culture in the years after uh, Trafalgar and after the Napoleonic War period ended in 1815. And this, of course, is represented in Turner's works, not least this watercolour on the left-hand side, which was owned by John Ruskin and again was donated to the Fitzwilliam Museum in 1861, where you see the first Nelson's column, which was erected in Yarmouth. And actually, the, uh, the, the person looking after that particular monument was, in fact, a veteran of the Battle of Trafalgar. And then you can see in the foreground, the sold, uh, sailors actually reenacting the battles with the ships of the line. Can you see right down the front there? Again, this is something that Turner does again and again. But this watercolour was actually owned by Ruskin, which I think is really important. And on the right hand side, we have this wonderful photograph just to show that actually there were black sailors um, in the Royal Navy and possibly veterans of the Battle of Trafalgar as well. But then just finally, I wanted to look at um, really how the harbours of England and also the notes on the Turner Gallery actually really engage with a very important element of Trafalgar and the culture of Trafalgar post-1805. And that is that around this idea of Trafalgar as an event um, that was victorious, but also um, involved supreme sacrifice. Um, in 1805, um, after Nelson's death and his funeral in 1806, it was a state funeral and it was, um, it was, it was, it was really engineered in order to galvanize British public opinion about a war that actually would go on for another 10 years. So it really was a propaganda um, as well as a state funeral. It was an important element of how to galvanize the idea around the heroic death of Nelson in order to keep people interested in the war as it were. But, uh, and Nelson of course lay in state um, in the painted hall, which Turner represents on the, in the right-hand side. You have the light shining on the old, the um, Greenwich Hospital and then curving down the River Thames towards um, St. Paul's Cathedral, where, of course, Nelson was buried. And I think it's worth pointing out that Turner himself actually requested to be buried in St. Paul's as well. But the element I want to pull, pull out here, because we've already seen numerous representations of Nelson um, previously in, in my talk and elsewhere, but this one uh, top left by Arthur William Davis plays into a major theme in representing Nelson, which is using the iconography of Christ's descent from the cross. Again, just linking through and him sort of swathed in these shrouds. And remember the use of shrouds in Turner's first Trafalgar painting, which the, the mizzen shrouds, as he called them, this idea of sacrifice, of apotheosis, if you like, but also this kind of Christian iconography of, of sacrifice is very, very important to the representation. And I think it's also very important to the way that Turner writes um, in, in both of these um, texts that I've mentioned. So then just to end on, I wanted to really um, 
with Ruskin's, I suppose, tribute to the Fighting Temeraire, notes on the which are in the notes on the Turner Gallery, uh, published in 1857, beginning of 1857. And just to sort of read out some excerpts from it, because it really is, I think, one of his, his one most wonderful texts. And, and it sort of, I think, encapsulates everything that I've just been saying. And I quote, the painting of the Temeraire was received with a general feeling of sympathy. No abusive voice, as far as I remember, was ever raised against it. And the feeling was just. For of all pictures of subjects most visibly involving human pain, this is, I believe, the most pathetic that was ever painted. The utmost pensiveness which can ordinarily be given to a landscape depends on adjuncts of ruin, but no ruin was ever so affecting as this gliding of the vessel to her grave. A ruin cannot be for whatever memories may be connected with it and whatever witness it may have borne to the courage or the glory of men, it never seems to have offered itself to their danger and associated itself with their acts as a ship of battle can. The mere facts of motion and obedience to human guidance, guidance double the interest of the vessel, nor less their organized perfectness, giving her, giving her the look and partly the character of a living creature that may indeed be maimed in limb or decrepit in frame, but must either live or die and cannot be added to nor diminished from heaped up and dragged down as a building can. And this particular ship crowned in the Trafalgar hour of trial with chief victory, prevailing over the fatal vessel that had given Nelson death. Surely if anything without a soul deserved to be honored or deserved honor or affection, we owe them here. And so it goes on actually, it's a, it's a wonderful passage, really worth um, reading because I think it does to my eye, really encapsulate everything that had happened from 1805 onwards in prose, sort of responding to the visual culture, where the nation was in the 1850s, moving on, as it were, into another world. But I think what Ruskin might be saying here is never forget, don't forget. And I think that's forget the sacrifice, forget um, what has been done um, for the nation. Thank you very much.